What were the threats that hip hop subculture was facing in the mid 90s? All right, number one, G Funk, the West Coast, the invasion, the, the, you know, it taken over. I mean, people from New York, East Coast MCs who were part of where this all started, you know, took, took offense to this. They got chip on, I mean, they got chip on their shoulders. Um, you know about this, and so when y'all get knocked off, my fuckers weren't feeling good about that, you know. And so there was a there was a threat that you know this G funk style that you know these people like Dre and Snoop who who were and are actors, you know, who who you know to many did were not authentic, but you know cares that wasn't like a priority in, in the music and, and it's fucking soul, you know, records, but that was a threat. Um, record labels and, um, you know, a, A&Rs and owners of record labels um, and particularly white late record label executives. Um, this is a screen grab from Fly By Night, which I'll show you some clips from and I'll show you this one scene uh, later, in, later in this unit. Uh, yeah, white rappers, corny white rappers like Vanilla fucking Ice. Um, you know, that was a major threat because that dude sold bajillions of records. Um, and he was a complete fake, phony liar about his background and history, which we'll talk about in, in a few units. Um, the other thing that was definitely um, a threat was like, you know, you, you know, this is an image of LL Cool J, you know, uh, with his shirt off, you know, from old school LL Cool J, um, you know, 10, 12 years before, you know, to shirt off, licking his lips all the time, LL Cool J. Um, but a lot of it had to do with like, you know, what started happening as rap becomes mainstream, um, you know, and these artists get signed to labels, they want to you know, exploit them in some ways um, sexually. So they start having artists who work out, lift weights, appear with no, you know, no shirt on for, you know, promotions and stuff like that. But for like someone who's like trying to keep it real and about authenticity, that, that ain't, that ain't, that ain't it. You, you know what I'm saying? Uh, obviously, you know, the suburbs uh, were, th were a threat, you know, um, how, you know, rappers and MCs made music and their content, you know, to sell to the suburbs, you know, and that's, that was a major, um, major part, you know. And then lastly, you know, hey, listen, like, you know, um, I remember this era fondly um, and, you know, Puffy. <laughs> Puffy was a threat uh, in the sense of like, Diddy was like trying to, you know, uh, even with Biggie, like he started putting R&B singers on the hooks, right? And started to make things sound all glossy and club, club sound and stuff. Um, you know, found really dope loops and didn't change them at all. Um, you know, stuff like that. But, but you know, he, he, he really had a huge influence on, on making rap uh, mainstream in, in the mid 90s and really changing the sound. I mean, if you listen to uh, Notorious B.I.G.'s, um, uh, ready to die versus his later effort life after death. I mean, it's like totally, you know, totally different um, vibe. I mean, you li listen to, um, you know, early Tupac, you know, uh, where he's like saying stuff, like really saying some, some stuff about Oakland and he's, and he's, he's making like kind of like poetic conscious records to like later. I mean, not that he didn't have some fodder later, but his death row stuff was, you know, pretty, you know, different. <laughs> you know, it was just completely different sound, completely different vibe, and it was making like party and type and club type records, you know.